A very good evening to all of you. I am Piali and uh, I welcome you all to our today's uh, webinar. Today we have a very special guest with us, Arne. Arne is a certified scrum trainer from Sweden and today he will be talking about how to become a successful product owner. So I will not take further time of yours and uh, would request Arne to take this show forward. Arne, over to you. Okay. Hey, thank you, Piali, and uh, welcome to all of you uh, listening. Uh, we chose uh, this subject, uh, becoming a successful product owner, in uh, order uh, because the product owner is a very important role in um, in Scrum. And um, so, I'm just going to show my screen here now, so that we can start the presentation. And uh, let's see. So here. So now hopefully you should see the first slide of my presentation, Becoming a success, Successful Product Owner. Is that so? Yes, your screen uh, is visible. Okay. Good, okay. So um, uh, becoming a successful product owner is important because the product owner role is one of the important roles in Scrum. That's the role that decides what is the right product to uh, to build and uh, becoming a new product owner sometimes uh, is difficult and uh, becoming a successful product owner sometimes is very challenging so uh, I'm going to talk about that and uh, we're going to try to involve you uh, listening a little uh, as we go along also so um, the first picture uh, you may uh, ask yourself what is this and uh, well, some of you have already decided that this is an empty desk. And uh, is this the way you would like it if you start as a new product owner? Probably not. Um, as a new product owner, uh, this is unfortunately what happens in a lot of situations. Uh, you're asked to become a product owner, you accept, you're happy about it, and you're left without support. That happens too often. Um, so in this session, my aim is to give some ideas on principles to follow and tools to use in order to become a successful product owner. Uh, my hope is to give some guidance to you so that you can uh, navigate through the product owner labyrinth. Uh, what is next thing to do? Who should I talk to? Who should I listen to? What kind of decisions should I make? What kind of decisions? can I make? Um, am I empowered to make decisions? Um, so let's take a look at the empty desktop again. Uh, if I were a new product owner, what I would expect and what I would feel very grateful to have on my desk when I get to work is uh, a product owner playbook. Um, it may look something like this. Um, a product owner playbook uh, to me is a collection of tools, a collection of templates, a collection of trainings that uh, is customized to your organization. Um, it's, uh, it's an artifact that summarizes the most important aspects of the product. And uh, to me, it serves as a high-level overview of all things necessary to know for a product owner to be successful. It can be used as a guide uh, to be and to continue to be a successful product owner. Um, so it's a little like uh, in sports. Uh, if you watch football, for example, you may see that uh, the manager have a, a playbook that uh, he or she shows to the players before they are entering the field. Um, and the, a product owner playbook can be used in, in the same way. So um, let's take a look at possible content of a product owner playbook. And uh, I say possible content. Uh, and the reason why I say possible content is that uh, situations are different. Um, you will all have specific situations. So this list, you may use it as an inspiration. Um, and you may use it to, uh, to uh, have as examples. But you still need to ask yourself, what do I need in my situation? What is best beneficial for me as a product owner? So uh, we'll 
take a look at this. So what I put on the list here of examples of possible content of a product on a playbook is a list of important stakeholders. And we'll talk a little more about that later on. Uh, a product vision. That may be one of the most important things to have uh, in a product owner playbook. Um, a product roadmap, including release information, uh, telling uh, stakeholders what to expect and when to expect it. A product backlog, of, of course. Um, something that we call definition of ready. That's something that many um, product owners and the development teams, they use together. Uh, to uh, fully understand when something is ready for next sprint planning. When a, a need or a requirement or a, a user story is ready for next sprint planning. Definition of done is very important because at the end of a sprint in Scrum, we want the development team to say, now we're done. And we want to be able to understand what does that mean. We want to have an agreement between the product owner and the development team upon what that means. Um, so, uh, is there anything missing? Well, probably there are things missing for your specific situation. So, um, uh, this question is definitely relevant because uh, you may get some inspiration from the list that you see on the screen right now, and, and you have some examples here. Um, but before digging deeper into this, uh, uh, we would like to start a first poll of this uh, webinar, and uh, this is a question for, for you guys out there. And uh, please uh, fill in as many answers as you want. Uh, uh, so the question is, which of the following artifacts are used in your company? Uh, and we will allow a minute for you to, uh, to answer this, and uh, we will uh, maybe do I need to re-share my screen? Yeah, I have uh, launched the poll, Arne. Okay, great. So l please let me know when uh, when uh, the minute is out uh, or when we have reached 80% uh, answers. So we can close the poll, I think. Yeah, please. Yeah, here is the poll result okay. I have shared. Yes, so um, if we take a look at this, we see that 69% of the respondents have clicked definition of done, and that's really, really good. Um, I also see that 68 and 61% have answered product roadmap and product vision uh, uh, respectively. Um, so uh, those are all good things to have, and uh, that's, what I, that's what I would expect uh, someone to have. Uh, definition of ready is really, really good because uh, if uh, more organizations had a definition of ready, they would actually see that their productivity would increase. We'll talk a little more about that definition of ready and the ready state later on. Um, stakeholder model, 30% uh, of those responding have uh, answered that they have that in their organization. And I believe that a stakeholder model is really good to have. So I will um, try to share my screen again and yeah. uh, then continue to talk about, uh, let me see here, talk about. Uh, yeah, here is your screen back. Okay, so uh, do you see the possible content uh, slide again? Yes, yes. Good. So, uh, Let's continue and talk about stakeholder model. Uh, what you see on this uh, on this uh, image is a stakeholder model for a company. And uh, in traditional ways of using a stakeholder model, uh, you take a look at internal stakeholders for a company, and you take a look at external stakeholders for a company. Um, when you are a product owner, you may not want to put company in the middle. You may want to put product in the middle. And it's still relevant to talk about external stakeholders, and it's still relevant to talk about internal stakeholders. Um, a good product owner is really, really customer focused, user focused. So users and customers are typically um, in the set of external stakeholders. Uh, you may have what you see in this uh, uh, picture as well, 
uh, but customers and users I expect to see there. Probably shareholders, creditors uh, is not there. Maybe suppliers, but probably not either. Society in a way, government, the regulations, authorities may be there. So um, a stakeholder model for a product, I would expect uh, the product owner to first identify uh, relevant external stakeholders and then to identify relevant internal stakeholders. So um, it could be employees, could be managers, maybe not owners, but it could be. could definitely be other departments. Uh, it could be, uh, could be teams uh, developing other products or uh, working on the same product so that we clearly see who is involved in working on this product. And what I would also expect from the product owner is to decide the importance of each type of stakeholders um, to have this as a guidance. So um, a stakeholder model is something that may be beneficial for, uh, for a product owner. Um, what's next on the list is product vision. Um, and uh, I expect uh, every product owner working according to Scrum to have a product Product vision. So let's talk a little about the product vision in Scrum. Uh, the product owner is responsible for putting together and responsible for communicating uh, a product vision. Uh, this uh, image is to, to illustrate that. And so what is the product vision and what is the reason why we want to have one? Well, the product vision should give us some direction and focus. It should guide the development team or development teams. Uh, it should help the team or the teams to stay focused, to really work on what is important right now to, uh, to get this great product out of the door uh, for the company. And, and a product vision should enable, uh, should align stakeholders, sorry, should align stakeholders. Um, uh, a product vision should cover who is the customer, uh, what is it that we are offering the customer, what kind of need uh, is this uh, helping the, the customers to, to, to uh, reach, what kind of opportunity are we helping them to reach, and why are we doing this. Um, so uh, there are different ways of uh, creating um, product vision. Uh, one way of doing it is using a, a game from uh, the book Innovation Games by Luke Coleman called The Vision Box. And what you see on the pictures here are some examples from uh, product owner classes of mine where uh, the, um, the participants, they have created vision box for, uh, for some of their uh, ideas. So th these are make up uh, ideas. Uh, a vision box should help us to understand what is really the product or the service and uh, what is the benefit of it. So um, you see some examples here. A good product vision should be shared. So everyone working on the product should understand it and share it. It should be stable so that we have the same direction for, a, for a, um, as long as it's necessary. should be clear so uh, that it's easy to understand. It should be broad, um, and broad um, is the opposite of narrow. A narrow product vision doesn't give very much room for different creativity by the development team to uh, find out the good ways of implementing the product. So um, a broad product vision allows for different possible implementation. So that's why it should be broad. A good product vision should be engaging. We should understand why the world will become a better place if we develop this product. Um, that's the words of uh, Jeff Sutherland, the creator of, uh, of Scrum. What I like to think is that an engaging product vision is one that uh, when I wake up in the morning, makes me want to get dressed and ready for work and just run to work so that I can continue developing this great product. That would be a very engaging product vision to me. And it should be concise. Um, there are other ways of starting to create a product vision than uh, the product vision box. Uh, you could use an elevator pitch. You could use other things as well. Um, 
one template that's used by many, uh, quite common, is uh, from the book Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore. And uh, Jeffrey Moore, he, uh, he talks about the target customer for whom we are uh, creating this product or service. Um, also uh, about the statement of need or opportunity for the, uh, for the customer. Uh, then, of course, uh, it mentions the product and what kind of category it is. And uh, we want to include key benefits or compelling reason to buy the product or key benefits and compelling reasons to use the product because we may not always develop product for, for, um, for sale. Uh, we may sometimes develop products that are for support of our internal business uh, operation. And then it should, of course, be key benefits and compelling reasons to use that product. And then it's good to understand what is the primary competitive alternative. Uh, if we are selling, who are our primary competitors? If we want this to be used within our company to support our business operation, what is used today? What is the things that are the competitor to using this new great product? And then, of course, the differentiation. Why is this product different? Why is this service different from what others are offering and from ways that we are using today? Um, so um, this is one possible template to use that is used by many, um, a template for a product vision. Um, I mentioned that uh, during my uh, certified Scrum product owner classes, um, I have participants uh, creating uh, product visions. Here is one example where a group was uh, using the more template. Um, so the product here is yourbike.com, and it, it's for bike raiders. Riders uh, and bike riders who want to buy a custom bike. Uh, so this is a marketplace that let constructors provide custom bikes um, for sale. And uh, it's unlike a traditional bike store where standard bikes are sold. This solution supports purchase of individually and custom designed bikes. So this is a couple of words that can help people uh, communicate their product vision and can help. Uh, stakeholders and team members to better understand what they are, uh, what they are uh, uh, developing. Um, product discovery uh, is something uh, that uh, a product owner benefits from doing. Um, this is a term that uh, was coined by a man named Marty Kagan. And uh, he has written about this in his book, Inspired. So discovery is to how to understand the right product to build. But product discovery also defines uh, how we can build it. So is it possible to build it? Not only understanding what is uh, necessary, why something should be built for whom and what, but also uh, thinking about what is possible. So um, when it's about product discovery, what um, Marty Kagan uh, talks about is focus on misery. Do not focus on technology. So what is making the life hard of the users, of the potential customers? Um, and then what he also says is it's very, very good for a product owner to engage the development team early. Um, what we see in a lot of traditional ways of working is uh, long periods of time where we try to discover the right product to build, but we do not involve the developers at all. So we have free studies, we have feasibility studies, we come up with great product visions with great set of requirements, but we haven't really understood if it's feasible to build it. So engage your developers early. Uh, it's really, really good to use prototypes rather than product requirements documents. Uh, product requirements documents may be useful, but prototypes may probably be even more useful. Um, and then, as a product owner, lead by objective, not by instruction. So uh, a product vision is a way of leading by 
objective. And as a product owner, remember that it's not only about representing stakeholders, it's also about being available for the team members during the sprint. So manage by wandering around. Visit the developers while they are creating the product. So try to understand how easy it is or how hard it is, what are the possibilities, so that you better can uh, support the, the development team. As a product owner, uh, it's good if you can, in some way or another, uh, help build a team with a core of passion, integrity, and empathy. And of course, in Scrum, there is not only the product owner and the development team, there is also the Scrum master. But um, it's good if the product owner takes part in this. So product discovery is something that you may be interested in, in thinking more about as a product owner in Scrum, and also doing it on an iterative way. We may not be able to fully discover all the uh, possibilities already during, uh, during, uh, during the product discovery, uh, but also it's good to do it while we're building the product. Okay, uh, visualization. Um, successful product owners are able to visualize things for themselves and for others. Um, so um, we want to visualize the things that are easily hidden if not focused on. So if we take a look at how it can be in an organization, there are certain things that are above the surface and other things that are below the surface, that are not really visible. So as a product owner, what are the things that I may need to visualize uh, to make clearer? Well, often what we see in an organization is that practices are quite visible. It's easy to see what kind of practices um, am I as a product owner using? What kind of practices are uh, development team members using to develop the product? Uh, we often call them engineering practices. What is not as visible is principles or our principles and values. So uh, principles and values uh, are things that uh, you may benefit from, uh, from uh, visualizing as a product owner. So what are the things that you as a product owner need to visualize. Maybe you need to visualize the product vision. Maybe you need to visualize uh, the, the business value model. What are we considering to be business value? Uh, maybe we need to visualize the, the stakeholder model. So this is for you to discover what you really need to visualize. The things that you know, but others does not know unless you visualize them. And that they would benefit from knowing. This is a hard thing. This is a challenging thing for any human being to, because I know what I know. And then sometimes I forget that just because I know about it, others do not know about it. So um, I think it's time for, um, for another poll right now. And um, uh, the, the second poll, the question is, um, what are the things that would make you a better product owner? So, uh, Piale, could we uh, yes. get the second yes, yes. poll going? Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, yes, I have uh, launched the poll. So, what single thing would make you a better product owner? Uh, I'm closing the poll now. Yeah. yeah. I have okay. shared the result. So, Yes, um, so on top of the list, 42% is better understanding of customer needs. And um, that makes me really happy because uh, a successful product owner understands customer needs. So um, this is challenging, of course. So what are ways that we can better understand customer needs? That's something that you may want to ask yourself as a product owner. Are there better ways than we are using right now? And are there um, different ways that we may try and, uh, and uh, use in, in a more um, beneficial way? Uh, and this uh, question that we had as a quick poll, what single thing would make you a better product owner? You may want to uh, 
ask yourself that question over and over and over again. And of course, if we become better at understanding customer needs, what is the next thing that we should be good at? Better understanding of value creation is number two on the on the poll result, results. And uh, creating a product vision, uh, focus more on product discovery, better collaboration with my development teams. They are all candidates. And you may want to make this list longer. Uh, other things that is good for a product owner to do and would make you become a better product owner. So um, I would like to continue the presentation. Uh, so uh, could you help me to change to my screen again? Yeah. So uh, unfortunately, you have to look at me for two seconds, but I think you can survive that. So we were talking about uh, visualization. Um, and I will talk about a couple of uh, tools now that um, a product owner may want to use in order to better understand the customer needs. So we'll talk shortly about value proposition canvas, business model canvas, and lean canvas. Um, in uh, 2010, I read a great book called uh, Business Model Generation. It's uh, written by uh, Alex Osterwalder and many other people uh, as well. Uh, and in that uh, book, he uh, presents uh, business model canvas. A couple of years uh, after that, he, uh, he wrote another book called Value Proposition Design. And in that book, he uh, presents the value proposition canvas. Um, the first book was uh, written in 2009. I think it was published in 2009. And since then, I've seen all different types of canvases. So that's something that you may have seen as well. And uh, to me, the word canvas is not the important thing here. Uh, what can we use? What kind of thinking tools can we actually use to better understand the customer needs and how to create a good product to cover those needs? So um, you may also have seen things like product scorecard and product vision board that aims to do similar things. and. Uh, may have uh, had uh, inspiration from the business model canvas. Um, so here is a picture. What you see to the right is the customer. What you see to the left is the product. Uh, and of course, the product that we create should meet the needs of the customer. Therefore, you have the two uh, arrows. Um, so the value proposition canvas is what we're going to talk about first. That's a thinking tool to visualize two basic things, the customer segment that you want to create value for, that's the right thing, and the value proposition that you believe will make your customers wanting to buy your product or use your service. And, and of course, the fit, that's the arrows. So the value proposition is to the right. When we take a look at our customer uh, segment, uh, then we want to take a look at the customer jobs. So in the instructions for creating a value proposition canvas, uh, it said that you should describe what a specific customer segment is trying to get done. It could be the tasks they are trying to perform and complete. It could be the problems they are trying to solve or the needs they are trying to satisfy. So um, my, um, my example that I have used often is um, imagine years ago when we were not able to, uh, to um, book flights or travel arrangements on the internet. Uh, what were the customer jobs then? Well, if I wanted to, uh, to um, create uh, a vacation trip for my family, uh, I had to go to a travel agent or I had to uh, send for information from uh, airlines and things like that. So the job of the customer was quite uh, cumbersome at that time. Uh, so try to understand that and uh, try also to understand what are the basic needs of our customers or the users. Uh, examples of customer jobs is not only functional jobs but also social jobs. And by 
show jobs. We think about things like to look good, to gain power, to gain status. So um, you you know that many people uh, still today wear uh, a watch and different types of watches they fulfill the functional jobs we can see what time it is what date it is and so on uh, but that's the functional jobs the social jobs is okay what do i want people to think about me when i wear this, this watch so there is a social job uh, there could be uh, emotional emotional jobs as well that could be aesthetics could be security could be feel good and um, so those are all different examples of uh, customer jobs. Pains. Um, this is about emotions. Uh, negative emotions, undesired costs and situations, and risks that your customer experiences or could experience before, during, and after getting the job done. So um, that's something to think about as well. And then to complete the, the customer segment uh, description, uh, what are gains? Um, the benefits your customer expects, desires they would uh, be surprised by, um, or um, things that they um, they didn't even know that they uh, wanted. This could be functional utility, of course, social gains, uh, positive emotions, and cost savings. Then, by using this, uh, by switching the the focus from observation. The circle is about observation to the left, deciding a product or a service with pain relievers and with gain creators. So the square to the left is about value creation. This is about designing a product. The first circle was about observing, and now it's about designing something that will meet, need the, the, meet the needs. Um, the value proposition canvas fits very well together with the business model canvas. Um, that's uh, you see the customer segment and the value proposition parts. Um, when you have reached this far, you can take a deeper look at the business model canvas. Uh, you typically start with the customer segments and then the value proposition, as we talked about. Then you take a look at the right side with customer relations channels, how to reach the, the customers, uh, and the revenue streams. And then on the left side is the internal things. Uh, what are the key resources, the machines, the, the people, uh, key activities, key partners, and what is the cost structure? This can help us to create the business model. And it's not in every company that the product owner is uh, responsible of creating a business model but I believe this is good knowledge for a product owner to have to understand how my uh, product fits with the business model of uh, of our company uh, this is called a lean canvas and uh, Ash Moriah he used the business model canvas for a long time but he found that some of the parts some of the segments, he used the same answers every time. And he figured that I do not really learn anything about that. So he took away key partners and he added problem statements instead. He took away key activities and added a solution statement. He took away key resources and instead added key metrics. In what way can I measure to make sure that we are actually getting in the right direction, that we are successful and so on? And he took away customer relationships. And he added a thing that is, to me, very intriguing. He calls it the unfair advantage. And this is about our offering from the perspective of our competitors. So um, in what way can we uh, exemplify an unfair advantage? Well, um, I come from Sweden. I have Swedish, the Swedish language, as my mother tongue. And I have, um, over the years, uh, learned uh, English to be able to express myself and uh, understand English in uh, talking and uh, writing. Um, with those two languages, I, I can get around the world fairly well. Uh, but when I get to certain countries, like uh, China, for example, I go to China to 
teach Scrum um, several times a year, then I believe that the Chinese people, they have an unfair advantage compared to me because they understand Chinese. They can uh, talk Chinese. They can read Chinese characters. And I can say hello and thank you in Chinese. So I believe they have an unfair advantage. So unfair advantage is something that we can offer that it takes a long time for our competitors to, to copy, or uh, which is very expensive for our competitors to, to copy. So um, it's more than a unique selling point. It's something that is unique in our offering that takes a long time or costs a lot to copy. So unfair advantage. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, the thing that I like most about uh, the lean uh, the lean canvas. Uh, here you see the lean canvas. To the right uh, is the customer centric things, and to the left is the internal things. Um, in Scrum, we want to get early feedback. As a product owner, I want to get early feedback. I want to get early feedback on my. Uh, on my product vision. I want to get early feedback on my ideas. So uh, working in an iterative way is really beneficial as a product owner. And uh, one way to do that may be taking a look at uh, Lean Startup. Uh, Lean Startup is about uh, creating a minimum viable product to get early feedback on our ideas. So. Uh, in this picture, you uh, have an idea, and then you build. You turn ideas into product. And then you measure, and you get data so that you can learn. So you can learn if you should persevere or pivot. Maybe pivoting is more relevant for entrepreneurs. May not be relevant in all, uh, all organizations. So what I get from taking a look at Lean Startup is uh, the notion of a minimum viable product and validated learning. I don't only think about things. I don't only analyze things in my head. I actually start with ideas. I design a product. I measure to get data. And then I learn. I get validated learning. Uh, MVP, minimum viable product, um, is something that was um, um, coined by uh, Eric Rice, who wrote a book about uh, Lean Startup. And um, there is another concept that I like to think about uh, that is similar, and uh, to me, even better. That's called Minimum mar Marketable Feature, MMF, Minimum Marketable Feature. What is the smallest feature that we can actually market to uh, gain, uh, to gain uh, revenue, to, to sell uh, the, the product? Um, that's something to think about for a product owner as well. Um, the product backlog uh, is a very important artifact for the product owner in, in Scrum. And um, the product backlog management is really important. So my illustration of a product backlog, you see large things at the bottom. Those are the things for the future. You see medium-sized items in the middle. And on the top, you see small-sized items. like. Uh, like user stories. And then um, let's take a look at the top. Um, in order to understand when something is ready for the next sprint planning, it's good to have a definition of ready. Um, so um, you can all see that the building in the middle, uh, if you take a look at this, it's not ready. And a couple of months later, uh, it looked ready, but that was just the external parts. Uh, um, when I visited Shanghai the last time, because this is a picture from Shanghai, that building was already ready. And it was possible to get up to the 119th floor to look out from the observation deck. Uh, but uh, here it's quite obvious that uh, it's not, uh, well, it's not done. Um, so definition of ready. What size should the items have? What clarity do they need before we can start developing? Because if we have the ready state, everything is ready for implementation, we don't need to spend time during uh, the sprint to figure out what is 
what does uh, the product owner need? Uh, what does the product owner mean by this? And so on. So that's all things that you need to, to be clear about as a product owner. Definition of done is really, really good as well. So what does it mean when the team says, now we're done? What are the things that we want them to do every single sprint so that we can uh, become more and more and more productive? Product, productive. So we want to reach a done state where the development team is able to do everything necessary to create a potentially shippable product increment each sprint. As a product owner, you will probably be involved in release planning. Uh, that's turning a product owner through a release planning meeting, uh, sorry, a product backlog through a release planning meeting into a, a release plan. That's up to the product owner to decide if that's necessary or not. And when you create a plan for a release, you may, as a product owner, benefit from knowing something about Kanu analysis or Kanu analysis. Um, that's the name of a Japanese guy who, who thought about uh, what kind of functionality do we have in products. Well, we, we have the basic fun functionality that I have called must-haves. Some things that you definitely need to have in a product for people to, um, to, to buy the product or use the product. So uh, when I take a look at the mobile phone, for example, what are the basic functionality that I would absolutely expect from a product, sorry, from a, from a mobile phone? Well, most people, when I ask the question, say, well, the possibility to make a call. Yes. So that's one example. Linear functionality, the more I get for the same price. So in a mobile phone, that may be the screen size, it may be the memory size, it may be um, connection uh, capacity, it may be uh, battery consumption, it may be uh, pixels in the camera application and things like that. The more I get for the same price. And then the delighters. The, things that I didn't even know that I wanted before I got them. Uh, and when I got them, I cannot be without them. So uh, you may think about that for mobile phones as well. For me, on my mobile phone is the, is the fingerprint recognition so that I can start the mobile phone by just uh, having it scan my fingerprint instead of entering a, a passcode or anything like that. The first time I saw... Uh, color screen on a mobile phone. That was a really delighting uh, functionality. I had no idea I wanted that. Today, I wouldn't buy a mobile phone without a color screen. So today, instead of being a delighter, this color screen has become a must-have. So Kano analysis may be good to, to use. Okay, so um, conclusion and summary before we open up for some uh, questions from uh, your guys. And so um, here you see uh, a roadmap of what we have done. We've talked about the product vision. We talked about discovery, release planning, uh, definition of uh, ready, definition of done. We've talked about uh, getting early feedback. And we've talked about the product owner playbook, uh, Kano analysis, how to deal with the product backlog. And we have not talked about what is on the bottom of this. This is a model from a book called Predictable Success. And this is really a model about how companies, they evolve from early struggle to the fun phase, through whitewater and up to predictable success. So a company, when they are in the fun phase, everything goes great. And then when they expand, things start to rock the boat. That's when you are in the white water, on the, on the, on the flood. Um, and you need maybe not only innovation, but some more structure. And when you get that, you get to a predictable success. If you put too much structure, then you get into treadmill. Every step is the same, and there is a risk that you go through the big rut and the death rattle of a company. I'm sure you can imagine companies going through those phases. So it's the balance between innovation and structure uh, and processes in your company. And then to the left, I and A, inspect and adapt. 
that's what Squam is about. That's what working in an empirical way is about. And so this is a short summary of what we have talking about. The principles that we have covered is uh, product discovery, and it's uh, the ready state, it's the done state, and, and it's uh, getting early feedback. And uh, the tools that uh, I have discussed, and I consider these to be thinking tools, are uh, the product owner playbook, uh, the product vision, a value proposition canvas, uh, business model canvas, lean canvas, and lean startup. Um, and uh, before we um, allow questions, uh, I would like to suggest a final uh, a final call because um, these are all tools, but tools may not be the only thing you need. Remember the values of the Agile Manifesto: individuals and interaction over processes and tools. So let's think a little about the individual, the product owner. So uh, the last poll before we uh, turn to Q&A is about uh, what are characteristics of a successful uh, product owner. So Piali, could you, you please uh, start the last poll? Yes, uh, I have launched the last poll. Okay, thank you. And uh, so, um, yeah, it, um, most of you answered customer-centric. Um, the most important characteristic of a great product owner to be, be customer-centric. Uh, Value-driven uh, comes as second. Um, decisive, decisive and empowered to make decisions was answered by 16%. And then empathic and business-minded uh, were um, only 1% each. And I think this is an important question to ask yourself over and over again as a product owner. What is the most important characteristic of a great product owner? Uh, and do I, do I have that? Am I customer-centric? Am I value-driven? Am I decisive and empowered to make decisions? Am I empathic? Am I business-minded? Those are things. Maybe there are other things as well that is important to become really successful. So, um, yeah. Uh, that's my presentation. Uh, we have uh, about 10 minutes for questions and answers. So, um, uh, yeah, let's... Uh, yeah, I'm uh, assigning you the questions, Arne. Here is the first question I have assigned to you. Yeah. So I can see that. Uh, let me see if I can see the full question. Um, it's how is vision different, but then I don't see the rest of it. Okay, the question is, how is vision different from goal? Leela is asking the how, question. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Leela, for this question. How is vision different from goal? And to me, vision is, is an image of a future state, a mental vision of a future state. So um, a goal is something that you uh, that you may reach, and and uh, there is not always a big difference between uh, vision and goal. I could even say that when you talk about the product vision, it should be possible to to reach the product vision. Uh, a vision in uh, general uh, is something that you you use to pull. Uh, yourself towards that, and you may not even be able to uh, to um, to get there. So there is not always a big difference, uh, but um, a goal should clearly be measurable. A vision is not always measurable. Um, a vision is is um, something that you can imagine in your in your head, something to picture what we're trying to do, and a goal may not help you to do that. So to me, uh, um, a vision is more forceful and more powerful than, than uh, using only goals. But goals are great as well. So I think that's the best I can do in answering that, that question. Here is the next question. Uh, Manish is asking, what should be the first step to become product owner from business analyst? 
Uh, thank you, Manish. Uh, what should be the first step to become product owner from business analyst? Um, this is one of my favorite answers, but I will elaborate on it. It depends. Uh, it depends on what you mean by a business analyst. A product owner is very well described in Scrum, and business analyst is different from one company to another. Uh, to me, the big difference between a product owner and a business analyst is that the product owner is has a bigger mandate, is more uh, empowered to make decisions, to de de decide what is the right product to build. Uh, a business analyst may not have that responsibility. So uh, uh, going from a business analyst for, to a product owner, of course the responsibilities will be different and maybe your uh, skill set need to be different. So having more uh, business uh, uh, skills, uh, more uh, understanding about uh, how to create value. Uh, and if you ask me, a business analyst is very, very good at helping developers understand what is the requirement and turning uh, user needs, customer needs into relevant, uh, relevant uh, uh, descriptions of that to help the developers to develop the right product. Uh, but the business analyst is not responsible of deciding what is the right product to, to build. So that, that, I would say, is the, is the different, difference and what uh, you need to focus on to go from a business analyst to a product owner. Here comes the next question. Ashok is asking, how to manage pressure to deliver from stakeholders while managing the discovery and iteration? Uh, thank you, Ashok. Uh, this is quite common. Uh, most com uh, companies, we have a pressure from stakeholders. We have a pressure from the customers. And um, in Scrum, the way we we deal with that is to work in an iterative way and also to deliver incrementally. So we try to deliver value early and continuously because what we get then is feedback on what we have delivered and we also get the opportunity to learn if we are moving in the right direction or not. And so I would say the, the iterative way and the incremental delivery, uh, the iterative uh, ways of working and the incremental way of delivering in Scrum help us to, to manage that pressure. And also asking the stakeholders and the, the customers about what is most important for them. What do they really, really need? And, and uh, breaking things down into smaller parts. Um, to give you an example, if you want um, a product to um, have the opportunity to, uh, you want to offer the opportunity to register users. So that requirement, user registration, you may break down into smaller parts. Uh, of course, you want to have to implement create user as first, and then you want to implement read information about the user. You may want to. Uh, to um, one, offer the opportunity to update the information for the user. And then when the user is not there anymore, using your product, you want to delete the user. So create, read, update, and delete. But if you do all of that, that will take some effort. If you can take away, initially, delete. That may not be necessary early on. If you can take away, update, and maybe only implement create and read, then you need less effort to deliver value. So that's one part of taking, one way of taking, uh, uh, to manage the pressure from stakeholders and customers. Okay, so uh, next question. Santosh is asking, do product owners need to keep timelines in mind uh, while deciding the product vision? Uh, thank you, Santosh. Um, I will say yes. Uh, product owners need to to keep timelines uh, in mind uh, when you when you plan when you do uh, release planning, for example. You can do that from uh, two different perspectives. It's either 
a fixed scope planning, uh, you say that, okay, we need all of these requirements implemented. Uh, so if you do fixed scope planning, you will come up with a, a date when that's possible to, to be done with. Or you can do it the other way. You can have a fixed date planning where you have a very important deadline. Um, so some, um, some companies, they offer uh, campaigns uh, before certain times of the year. Some uh, companies, they offer uh, products for the Olympics, for example. And you don't move the Olympics around, and you don't move holidays around too much. Um, so, so you have a very certain deadline. So fixed date, uh, uh, and that's uh, where it comes in. Uh, if the date is important, uh, we need to understand the timelines and things like that. So yes. Amit is asking, uh, how product owner can empower when they don't have opportunity to interact with customer directly due to geographical constraint? Um, yeah, uh, that is very, very hard. That's something that you need to, to um, discuss internally in, in your company. Um, because in order to represent stakeholders and customers, um, probably I need to uh, be able to meet with them. Probably I need to be able to, uh, to communicate with them. And so, so the big uh, challenge to me when you are not in the same geographical place as your uh, customers is how can we still be able to uh, communicate? How can we improve uh, communication? How can we get the communication to be as close to face-to-face -face communication as possible. So looking at tools for communication is definitely what I would uh, look for. Um, and so, so that's, to me, it's a communication challenge rather than uh, an empowerment challenge. Empowerment to me is not the same as communication. Okay, uh, last question. Satya is asking, what is the most important aspect of a healthy product backlog? Uh, Satya, thanks for uh, the question. Um, I refer to the DEEP rule by Mike Cohn, uh, where D stands for detailed appropriately. You have different levels of uh, um, granularity. E stands for estimated. You make sure that you understand uh, approximately how long time it will take to do the things on the product backlog. E stands for evolving or uh, emergent, so that you uh, allow your product backlog to evolve over time. It's not fixed from the beginning. Um, and you should take emergent requirements into consideration. And P stands for uh, prioritized. Um, to me, it's, um, I like to talk more about order than prioritized, but uh, detailed appropriately, estimated, emergent, and prioritized. Those are things that a really good product backlog uh, benefit from having. Okay, uh, there are a few more questions uh, which we are not able to handle right now because of uh, time boxing. Uh, friends, I would request you to tweet your question using the hashtag DiscussAgile. Uh, Arne can address those questions later. So it was a great uh, session. Thanks, Arne, for sharing your thoughts and insights about the product owner role. It was great having a discussion with you. And uh, okay, friends... Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you all for... Uh, for joining us during this um, webinar. Thanks. Yes, yes. Thanks, everybody, for joining in. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And uh, thanks once again, Arne. You're welcome. Thank you.